He said, I would like to have coffee in a clean cup. And when the waitress comes back, her first question is, who wanted the clean cup? How would you react to that? You're sitting in this restaurant and, and they have this dirty utensils, and then when she comes back, she wants to know who wants the clean cup. What would your reaction be? You have to walk out. <laughs> you have to leave? Yeah. Okay. What was that? Just watch, we're already on the skids here with that jumper. Okay. Yeah, we'd probably become upset, wouldn't we? We decide that we don't want to be in this restaurant. We'll go somewhere that is cleaner. What do you think Jesus thinks when he walks into the temple and sees what he sees going on? But we need to talk a little bit about what's going on so you will understand what Jesus is saying. But what we're going to look at first is the insult to holiness. Jesus is insulted by what he sees going on in this temple. It's the Passover, probably the most important feast of the Jews to have. Okay? That commemorates the deliverers from uh, Egypt and also is about our deliverance from sin. So when people from Israel came to Jerusalem to do this, they had to have a sacrifice, and they had to pay their temple tax, and the poor people could use a turtle dove instead of a, a lamb or whatever. Okay? But what was going on was this, that it was too far for a lot of these people to bring their sacrifice with them. So they had sacrifices there that was going to suffice for this type of sacrifice. But he had to buy it. Now, the first thing is you can't just buy it. You've got to have a certain coin. And let's say this coin is worth a dollar. And I, I sell the, the coins to you. I'm going to charge you 10 bucks for that. That way I can make a little money. Yeah. You want to preach this? So if I would need this coin to buy this animal, that for a dollar I was going to charge them ten dollars. They got to have it, right? What are you going to do? Okay. So then I would sell this animal to you, and I would take it for you to sacrifice, take it to the temple for you to sacrifice. Except I would just take it back around the back. Mm -hmm. Put it in there again and sell it again to somebody else. What do they know? Okay. So this is what Jesus sees when he walks in. Of the money changers, that's what they were doing. The sacrifice, all of that, that's what they were doing. Okay? And he is what? Insulted. He is angry. We don't think of Jesus being angry, do we? We don't think of him being in that kind of, you know, Jesus is supposed to sing hymns and pray and not, and like children. And that's as far as, as we see him did it. But we're going to look at another incident here. But what happens is that Jesus sees the corruption in the temple. And he is insulted by it. Okay? But today, folks, he sees the corruption in the church. And he's just as angry about that as he is about the temple. And that's the, the lesson that we need to learn here, that Jesus sees all, and he knows all, and he's not very happy about it. But what the, the travesty that is being made of his church, the, the things that are going on because of their desire to make money. Okay. What they have done to the temple, they turned the temple into a <coughs> super Walmart. It's a place where you buy stuff. It's a place of commerce, of business. It's not a, a temple anymore. It's not a place to worship anymore. It's a time to promote my agenda. So what did Jesus see when he walked in the temple?
greed. And that, I could tell you a lot of stories about that. But that's one of the, the things is that when the church becomes a money-making deal, that's not what we're here for. So you have to have money to live. Yeah, you do. And God's already promised he's going to provide that. Okay? It's a place of worship. It's a place of prayer. It's not a place where we try and see how much money we can get. Are you going to... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You want to preach this? It's an awful good time. They're making fun of God. They're mocking God. Is what they're doing. That's what Jesus is all about. Okay? The sacredness of the temple is defiled. And see, the problem is that it's such a normal thing that nobody notices. It's, it's just, oh well, that's the way it is. There's nothing you can do about it. And Jesus says, oh yes, there is. Uh, at least I can make my, you know, my thoughts known about it. He'll do this at the very beginning of his ministry, and he'll do it at the very end of the ministry. That he will cleanse the temple two times, one here in John, and the other's going to be in Matthew at the end of his ministry. But the great, the corruption, the temple, it's amazing as of what people will do in the name of religion. And we look at other people saying that's what they're doing, but aren't we maybe guilty of that too? And Jesus looks into the temple and he asks the question, how can they treat the Father like that? That's what he's angry about. There's a, another time in the Bible that it, it's kind of the, the same way that God is, is disappointed. How disappointed do you think he was? So you have a tendency to look and say, oh, we're, we're really not that bad. We're not as bad as those people on the street. But Jesus looks and sees the, the reality of that and says, yes, you are. How do you describe Jesus as a person? How would you, what words would you use to define him or describe him? Holy. Holy? Anybody else? Focus. What's that? Focus. Focus? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Here's another place. I don't know if I have it up here or not. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. That Jesus is about to heal a man that has a withered hand. And the only problem is that he's doing it on the Sabbath. He's not supposed to do the work on the Sabbath. And that one of those verses that says, And Jesus looked around with anger in his heart. Why? Why is he angry? You see, if somebody criticizes us, somebody mocks us, we get mad, don't we? That's why Marge is always mad. At me, too. But Jesus is just the opposite. They criticized him. They mocked him. He said nothing at all. But let them mock his father. All the different all. That's what they're doing. They are mocking his father, and he's not going to allow that to happen. The temple he is mocking his father, he's not going to let that happen without saying something. Can you ever think of Jesus being angry? You know what that would be like? Here is the God of all God angry. These people don't know what they're going up against here. They're not realized what they're doing here because it's so normal. It's so normal. And everybody falls into that category. So what does Jesus see in our temple? Now, we know, I don't know where 1 Corinthians 6 comes in here. Yeah, here in just a, a moment here. But what does he see? Now, I know that we are, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? But when we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's the word plural that you, together. Yeah, we may be the, the temple, you know, that's one of the big lies that we see in our world today. Your relationship with Jesus isn't just between you and him. 
When I become a Christian, I have, I have made it to a community called the church. And that church, when it gets together, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, too. Not just me and him. Remember, uh, Father G. told me <coughs> Jesus got one thing going. What a lie. It's, it's not possible. It is not possible for that to be true. I'm part of a community. It's always been that. It's always been that. Okay? Even in the first day of the, the church of Pentecost, it says that God added to their number. It wasn't just a, a private thing on the planet. So when he looks and sees our temple, what does he see in Centennial Christian Church? Where are we at? Are we pleasing to him? Would he come with his cords and start hitting at us? I want to make it clear that when Jesus does this, he never hits any person. He never strikes to hit any person at all. It's what they're doing that he's angry at. He's not angry at them. He's angry about what they're doing. They're making fun of his father. And he's not going to let that happen. Not at least without voicing his trouble that he's having with them. Jesus is offended. He's insulted. He is angry at what they're doing, at the irreverence toward his father. That's something that, that we have to look at here. We cannot equate our religious practices to the presence of God. That's not the same thing. Well, we're doing this, but that doesn't mean that God is present with it. Yeah, we have communion, but that doesn't mean God is present with it. All this that we have done doesn't mean he's present with us. So we can't say because I went to church today that I have fulfilled what God wants me to do. Because we all know that's not a fact either. Okay? That he is wanting us to serve him. He's wanting us to love people. And how we do these things, I don't think he really cares because the Bible doesn't tell us. Now, I didn't say he didn't care that we did that. He doesn't care how we do them. And then we find ourselves saying, well, we're the only one that's right. We're doing it this way. He doesn't care how it's done. Just what we do and the heart that we have when we do that. That our concern is out of our love for God. So, how might we corrupt the temple? So you're telling me that when you come to church on Sunday, you do everything from the purest motives that you want. Not one that you sat there and said, what do you eat? What do you eat? Yeah. How many have said that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, I know you, okay? <laughs> so you, how many times have you thought that? <laughs> okay, now go ahead. You realize that worship is something unique between you and God. When we take communion, we're not worshiping. It's preparing us to worship. That we commune with God. Just because we took the bread and the grape juice doesn't mean anything. Where was my heart at? And that's what Jesus is angry at. You're telling me that the God that saved you, that died on the cross for you, that you don't have an hour, an hour and a half, that you can focus on him completely about what he wants for your life. Wow. If that is true, then you better get down on your knees and pray and ask God for forgiveness. That's what Jesus wants them to do here. How many of you know what the Taj Mahal is? Okay, what is it? Yeah. And by the way, I do have an agitator in my dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> what? Somebody it? like you. Guild <laughs> <laughs> 1629. Shah Jahan's wife died. And this was made to be this huge memorial for her. And what they did is they took her casket and laid, buried it in the middle and had this whole thing it's supposed to be well, it is on the seven wonders of the world. Okay? But the problem was that his grief over his wife's death superseded his desire to build this. And he was out surveying it, seeing what he was going to do with it, and there was this box in the middle of it that he kept stepping and tripping over. 
So he finally told his workers to get that out, and they took it out and threw it away, and it was her casket. But somewhere in life, with all this other stuff, they got distracted, got off the mark, and he ended up throwing his, his wife's body away because he thought it was just his pot. We can do the same thing in the church. We can get our focus off. And we're missing the point here. Right? It's not how many people that we have here or, or how much money we've got in the general fund or whatever fund. It's about the worship of God. Period. And when Jesus sees them getting off track, that's why he gets angry that he's showing, they're showing a reverence disrespect to God. And he doesn't like that. He's not going to stand for it. So he's going to let them know. And of course they ask, by what power do you, what do you have? You answer the question. What power did Jesus have that he can do this? Pardon me? Son of God. It was his temple. I'm sorry? It was his temple. Okay. It was his temple. He decides... Not us. We can't sit there and decide here's what's right and here's what's wrong. He will. And by the way, as I think about it, it's his church. He ought to be the one deciding, shouldn't he, what we are to do at certain times in certain ways. So he, he is not going to allow this to get out of the way, so he then, the invitation to hold this. God's temple is a place of what? What? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Holiness. Okay? It's a place of prayer. It's a place of worship. So instead of just throwing everything in the big kizzy, he decides, I'm going to give them an invitation to come back to where I want them to be. Who has 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20? Now that I know that you will not even withhold your son, 
Now I can trust you. What is there that's in between you and God and your worship of God? You know what the danger of that is, don't you? That comes your pride. If Abraham would not have been willing to offer Isaac, then Isaac's his God. And what does that make Abraham? Idolatry. So when he looks at us, he wants not, nothing in between him and me. Can't be. Because whatever that is, is God. And if it's God, then I fail to worship the true God, the real God for us. Is that, I guess that the second one there. That is his temple mean to be clean again. We're going to, to go ahead and, and go beyond this. So Jesus, his desire was to remove all the barriers to, to true worship. He, he wanted to cut down all of that. This was a major distraction. It's kind of like the dog that was barking really loud outside the store. And a customer said, what's wrong with that dog? He said, well, he's sitting on a bird. He said, well, why doesn't he move? He got a dollar. We'd rather not deal with what the real issues are. The real issue is that our temple needs to be cleansed. The issue is that we need to come back to where God wants us to be, not the status quo, not this is the way it's always been type of thing, but that we need to come back to the real issue, and the real issue, folks, is our temple needs to be clean again. That we need to get really honest with God again. You know, we talk about having revival, but before revival can happen, that we're going to need to clean the temple. Very quickly, we're, we're going to close there. The inspiration holder, this matter is Jesus is. He demonstrates his great passion for his father and his house. When it says that your zeal for you, your home, your house consumes me, the word consume there means this great cry of desperation. That he is so upset, so disgusted by what he sees that he is just completely out of his mind. He is wanting so badly for God to go back to where he's supposed to be. Do we have a desire, a deep down desire for the worship of God? Romans chapter 12, we read that for our close of this. We had the communion meditation. And you talk to us. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, when you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Thank you. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed. See, conform is from the outside. Transform is on the inside. And he says, be transformed. Meaning, he's past the goodness. God is the one that's going to transform him. God is the one that's going to change him. It must be our desire for that to happen. Because the irreverence, the lack of honor of God, is breaking God's heart. What would Jesus do if he walked in this moment? That he could see all your thoughts. He could see what really is in your life. What, what would he do? What would you do? I think he would sit and just watch us. Let us. I think we probably would wrap the cord and come at us. That's what I think. Okay. See, it is my personal opinion, just, just you know, that if Jesus was walking on earth today and came in to preach here, we <clears> could not stand him. We'd want him out of here in a hurry, in a hurry, because of the holiness that was in him, because all of us folks are miles and miles away from where God wants us to be in our life. And I, I, I believe that, that he would come in and preach and we couldn't wait for him to get out, or we'd get up and walk out on our own, because we didn't like what he was saying. Now he's trying to save us, but we would be upset to tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. I'd rather Talk about Charlie West and what he's doing wrong. Because you know Charlie's worse than I. 
I don't know. I would just drop it. <laughs> there are the church that was having problems with the clock. And the preacher worked on it, worked on it, and never did work. So finally, when the folks came to church one Sunday, had a sign up there that says, Don't blame the hands, the problem's deeper. It's deeper, it's, it's in our hearts, is where the problem is. And will we be, be willing to surrender our lives to Him completely? Now, we, we may not accomplish that because we're human, but would we be willing to? Is that what we desire? Is that what we want? Is to surrender our lives to Him completely? Isn't it time to have our death cleansed? And the only way, folks, that I know how to keep the world out of the church is by keeping Christ filled when there is no room in the world. Our invitation today is uh, near the cross. Room at the cross. I knew that cross. Okay. There's room. We can do that. I don't care <coughs> if you've been a member of Centennial Christian Church for 40 years. That's not the point. Are you right with God? Is your temple cleansed? Are you ready to come to him and surrender this and make the temple holy again? That is the question that we have to answer. Let's stand. Let's stand.